Well, thank you very much. Great pleasure um, to be back here and have a chance to um, share some ideas about where we're going in uh, the application of genomics into medical practice. Understand this is a CME offering, so here are my disclosures. And take the perspective, first of all, that a lot has happened, as you'll see, and certainly as you know, in genomics in the past now decade and a half, more or less. But one of the fundamental questions is this one, when will physicians actually routinely use genomics in their day-to-day -day practice? And you may have seen this so-called hype curve. I pulled my version of it from Wikipedia, as you see. The idea that something impressive happens, such as the sequencing of the human genome. There's a lot of high expectations. Things don't turn out to be quite as easy as they seemed. I like to think we're on this slope of enlightenment and maybe even have approached this productivity plateau for some things. And what I'll try to show in this next hour or so are some examples of things that are happening now in the application of genetics and genomics into day-to-day -day practice, and then make some comments about where things may be going, realizing that this is such a fast-moving area, predictions are really very difficult to do. I'm going to use a kind of thought experiment as a way to go through this, and that is to imagine a family with this um, family tree. We're going to focus on Laura, and we're going to follow her from birth until maybe her 60s and ask the question, where does genetics and genomics contribute to life decisions or medical decisions in this individual? as she sort of passes through different epochs of her life. Now, there are a few things you'll just have to sort of accept as um, not particularly real world here. The first is I am not going to try to guess what genomics is going to look like in 60 years. So if the clock started today, I'm certainly not any better than anybody else at figuring out where it's all going that far into the future. So therefore. At every point in her life, we're going to be thinking about how genetics and genomics, as it is applied more or less today, you know, maybe plus a few years in a few cases, but fundamentally where it is now. Um, and therefore, as she ages, in a way, the clock is frozen. The second point you'll see in a minute um, is that this is, I guess, more or less a sort of white middle class family, and it's not an attempt to make any statement about access of individuals of different backgrounds and socioeconomic groups to genetics and genomics, I realized that could be a significant challenge. It just didn't make sense for her to change her ethnicity every time she grew a few years. Uh, so you have to accept that. And by the way, all the pictures here are just stock photos. They're not real patients. So we're going to consider these different epics. Um, look at first newborn screening soon after she's born, um, diagnostic testing, in this case for a sibling preconceptional screening, what happens when she's planning to start a family, prenatal diagnosis, presymptomatic testing, and finally, predispositional testing. So the story begins just after she's born. She has some blood drawn from a heel stick, which is true for all babies born in the U.S. and throughout much of the world. And her parents really never are the wiser, actually. They may question why the Band-Aid is there. Uh, but beyond that, this is just done, and they never hear again about it. And that's a very good example of no news is good news, because if all of the screening tests are negative, then that's typically um, the last the family will hear. So newborn screening now is just over 50 years old, and it dates to the ability to detect the levels of phenylalanine in the blood with a very simple, inexpensive assay, and the reason why was that if you detected PKU at birth and instituted a diet restricted in phenylalanine, it made the difference between a child who would have severe intellectual disability and epilepsy and having a fundamentally normal developmental future. And so this was a, a huge public health advance, probably the most significant one of the last century in terms of um, genetics and genomics as it applies to day-to-day -day practice, it has evolved quite a bit from the bacterial inhibition assays uh, 
that got this off the ground in the 1960s now to tandem mass spectrometry. Don't need to go into the technical details. The blood is drawn on the same filter cards as it always has been. It goes into the mass spec at one end, and you read a spectrum out the other, which in principle can diagnose dozens of different inborn errors of metabolism, more than you actually know the natural history of. And there's been a, a very productive effort, actually led by the American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics, to standardize, using an evidence-based approach, what are the specific analytes that diagnose things for which you have clear understanding of natural history and interventions that are proven to work, since it doesn't make sense to screen for things where either they don't have major medical significance or there's nothing you can do about them. Although it's determined on a state-by-state -state basis exactly what to screen for, there is now a kind of baseline of screening that, in the U.S. at least, um, pretty much all the states do, although some will add some things on top of that baseline. Well, as you probably know, actually NHGRI is funding a set of pilot projects to look at the question, should sequencing be the basis of newborn screening instead of the analyte testing? And there are a few others, like um, testing for deafness. And obviously, if one did, did sequencing, in principle, any genetic disorder could be detected, so it vastly increases the scope of what's possible to test for. However, it comes at a price, never mind the cost of doing it, but also all the various things you may find that are not so clearly medically actionable and about which perhaps the natural history is not known. And I think that's really the crux of the currently funded projects, to try to explore what the utility of this approach might be, the acceptance of it, and compare that to the standard which has been in place for a very long time. All right, so let's move on into diagnosis. Laura is now three, and she has an older brother who has been diagnosed as having autism spectrum disorder. One of the biggest, maybe arguably one of the first advances in genomics that saw the light of day in the clinic was the ability to do cytogenomics, as it's now called, microarray testing. The, I guess some would say that Genomics really, from a medical point of view, had its birth in the 1950s when it became possible to look at the full set of chromosomes and detect extra or potentially missing material. But it had to be fairly dramatic, well, not fairly, it had to be very dramatic to see it back in those days. A whole extra chromosome, as in trisomy 21, was detectable. Uh, but much more subtle changes back in those days were not. I guess it was sort of like taking a picture of the Earth from about the level of the moon and trying to detect subtle differences. Well, you could see volcanoes maybe, but you're not going to see um, things happening on a kind of street level. And that resolution has gradually been increased to the point now where copy number changes down to a few thousand bases can be detected. And this has increased the sensitivity of genetic detection of changes that are related to intellectual disability, autism spectrum disorder, and developmental problems, um, probably in the range of what it was, was perhaps 5 percent with um, cytogenetics to 15 percent or more uh, with the genomic microarray testing. Meanwhile, any certainly medical geneticist is familiar with this so-called diagnostic odyssey, wherein an individual has a clinical problem, you make your best guess as to what might be going on, and then perhaps order a genetic test that reflects your theory about what the etiology is, gets sent various places, whether to academic or commercial lab. It could cost up to a thousand or even several thousand dollars, depending on what the test is. And often is not, it turns out that's not the answer. And people cycle around this sort of um, loop, sometimes for years, causing huge frustration for the family, for the physician or physicians, oftentimes, who are involved, and racking up bills that could be in the thousands of dollars, realizing each turn of the cycle involves lots of medical tests. And so the ability now to do sequencing, exome sequencing or 
increasingly whole genome sequencing has really um, changed the landscape here quite dramatically. Here's an example of a child seen in our clinic uh, where genome sequencing produced an answer and in some ways a kind of a maybe unexpected set of answers. It was a child with severe seizures that began soon after birth, intellectual and developmental disability, and a um, MRI which is shown on the left uh, with significant cerebellar and also brainstem atrophy. He had gone through multiple rounds of standard testing, by the way, including microarray, no answer resulted from any of that. And ultimately, uh, we did exome sequencing together with our colleagues at Hudson Alpha uh, and looked at both this child and both parents. And what was found, actually, was um, two de novo variants in the child, that is, two variants that were not found in either parent, sp tan one and the set D5. Um, turned out the sp tan one variant, which is a um, duplication, has been described before, that exact same variant has, in other individuals. And I took a screenshot of a paper where that was described, and the clinical history and the MRI are remarkably similar to our patient, also cerebellar and brainstem atrophy, not as severe, actually, as in our patient, um, but qualitatively uh, very similar. So we felt very comfortable that this is very likely to be the pathogenic variant. It's been reported, actually, in several cases, aside from this one publication. It encodes a spectra and cytoskeletal protein that is um, expressed in brain, and the condition is referred to as infantile epileptic, epileptic encephalopathy type 5. SET-D5 is a um, gene that has been associated with intellectual disability, mainly because it's within an area of deletion in a copy number change that's been found in several individuals with intellectual disability. We feel pretty strongly that the sp tan mutation is the one that's most re relevant to the child's problems. This one, we don't know how much it's contributing, since this child would have been fairly profoundly intellectually disabled just on the basis of this one variant. And there's, you look at what you learn from sequencing, and you know, this is true for us, but I think it's true for most groups who are doing it. You find a handful of different kinds of things. Um, occasionally, you find a pathogenic variant that's very well described in a gene that is quite well understood in terms of its uh, pathogenic relevance, and sort of kick yourself afterwards, how come I didn't think of this? We've, we had a, a family um, of three sibs with intellectual disability and a um, kind of a degeneration of um, bones, especially um, the hip joint, who had gone through years and years of evaluations by lots of groups. Nobody had any idea what it was. They were being treated with anti-inflammatory drugs. It turned out after sequencing, the diagnosis was mucolipidosis, which is a pretty well-known inborn error of metabolism. Lysosomal enzymes don't get trafficked to the lysosome. Uh, and it, so it wasn't such an obscure diagnosis, and we kind of felt a little foolish that nobody had thought of it. And the only consolation was that um, we, I, was at the long line of a number of clinicians who hadn't figured it out. Um, and I think this is what happens when you're dealing with really rare, obscure presentations, that sometimes nobody puts everything together and it just popped out from the sequencing. So that's one thing that happens. The second is this kind of result. I think it's fair to say, certainly for me, and I bet it would be true for most of my colleagues, that we would never have thought of testing this gene. In fact, if we had, I'm not sure we'd have found a lab that actually does the testing because it's so vanishingly obscure. Um, it's just not on the differential diagnosis of this kind of condition. It certainly hadn't come out in any of the lists that we had generated, either from our own experience or from looking at databases. And I think we find a lot of examples of that, exceedingly rare, obscure things that you can find a case here and there that convince you that it's real, but still exceedingly obscure. Then the third thing, of course, are variants of uncertain significance, and we certainly have our share of those, as anybody who's doing sequencing does, that we just can't really know if this is truly pathogenic or not. There often is a convincing case, 
that you can make based on either segregation in the family or maybe de novo or maybe that you can infer a change in the function of the protein by computer modeling, even go so far sometimes as to make animal models. But you know, when is the threshold crossed that you're confident that it's really pathogenic is a tough area. And perhaps one of the things that may help in this is data sharing among groups, which I think offers at least the possibility of changing an N of one to an N of many, which may convince everybody that some of these truly are, or for that matter, truly are not pathogenic. But however you look at it, this has really changed the landscape in terms of diagnostics. It's not always so easy these days to get insurance coverage for the cost of the sequencing, even though you could make an argument that whatever you're paying these days, it's usually in the sort of six or $7,000 range when you package the sequencing and the analysis, depending on who's doing it and various sort of insurance deals. But getting coverage is not always so easy. And I don't think the insurance industry is so much doubting that it can be helpful. Uh, very few of these disorders, or at least not enough of them, let me say, are treatable because we now know the answer. But this family benefited because, among other things, they learned it was a de novo event. Yes, two de novo events, but still de novo, and therefore unlikely to recur barring germline mosaicism. So there was some value. It short circuits that diagnostic odyssey. They aren't going to be going through lots more diagnostic tests because we know what is causing this problem. So I think there's been tangible benefit, and it will probably save in terms of additional studies far more than it would have cost um, to have done this. So I, th I think they get that. Um, I think what is um, the area of concern includes um, the variants of unknown significance that I mentioned earlier, and how much of a chase do you go on trying to validate those. And then the issue of incidental findings. This is a screenshot from the paper in Genetics and Medicine now a couple of years ago uh, for a committee that I was part of. Um, trying to make recommendations for what would the threshold be for looking at incidental findings and reporting them. The recommendations in the original paper were the top three things. A list of mutations I'll show you in just a moment should be reported to the referring doctor, uh, regardless of the age of the patient. They should seek and report mutations on this list, and the ordering clinician then is responsible for counseling both pre- and post-test. The part that wasn't stated in the original paper was number four, that patients could opt out of learning about incidental findings. And I think the rationale in the committee's mind, and say this having been part of it, was, among other things, concern that people could blithely opt out, not really understanding what it was they were opting out of. And the metaphor that gets used a lot, which I know is imperfect, but probably as close as we're going to come in daily practice is the person who gets a chest x-ray because they, let's say, bruised their ribs in an accident. And the radiologist notices a shadow on the lungs that has nothing to do with the bruise, but might indicate a early lung cancer. And you probably know that, first of all, if they didn't report that, and it turns out someday it is a lung cancer, and you go back and look at that x-ray and realize it was there all along, uh, there could be liability for having not called attention to that. And I think that's a fairly well-established issue in radiology. And nobody, as far as I know, ever consents a person who's about to have a chest x-ray. Do you only want to know about your rib, or do you want to know about all the other things that might be found? So using that sort of metaphor, which, again, is not a perfect one, the committee didn't offer an opt-out. It created a firestorm. You sort of be careful what you wish for. You like to get attention for the things that you publish, and we certainly got attention. Um, but there were a lot of people who were offended at the idea that there wasn't a, an option for a patient to not want to know. I think that now it's been added a year later. It was added into the um, recommendations. Talking to folks doing this, very few people choose to opt out, but at least now the possibility is there. This is the list. I won't read it to you. But the, the concept here where there was a very high bar that a gene had to cross, so to speak, in order to be listed. It meant that this had to be something where there was really pretty much fireproof evidence of pathogenicity for that variant. 
It had to be medically actionable. In other words, it had to make a difference to the care of that individual to have determined this prior to onset of signs or symptoms. Of course, you wouldn't know if they had signs or symptoms at the time the test was sent. So it had to be a, a manageable condition where you could alter a person's outcome based on the finding. Natural history had to be well understood, and the penetrance had to be well understood. So lots of things that many people in the committee and now in the, there's a community effort to add, or for that matter, remove, if appropriate, genes from this list. But the committee has a fairly um, stringent test, and it won't put things on where there's any ambiguity about what the significance might be. A lot of these are cancer predisposition syndromes. These are associated with aortic aneurysms and dissection, cardiomyopathies that can occur insidiously, arrhythmias, hypercholesterolemia, and malignant hyperthermia. So it's a fairly short list of types of conditions and fairly modest list of genes. Some groups have added um, on their own to this list. Um, so this is still a very much work in progress. And by the way, it was recommended that a child who might be tested, let's imagine, for intellectual disability and incidentally might be found, let's say, to have a, a BRCA1 mutation that is of known pathogenicity, that we would report that, assuming the patient hasn't opted out of any incidental findings, that would be reported to the referring doctor and presumably in turn to the family, even though we don't generally recommend testing children for adult onset disorders. And the rationale here, first of all, was that who knows if this family has a history of, in this case, breast and ovarian cancer. Sometimes families are small and that, that um, diagnosis hasn't surfaced in anybody that anybody knows about in recent generations. Now you know this child has it and what would be the rationale for waiting for cancer to occur, which could be the outcome if you don't disclose it. So we wouldn't have offered testing to a child with a known family history, because then the child, when he or she grows up, could make a decision about testing. But if we have no information about family history and you discover it incidentally, it could have significance to the child and incidentally also to a parent who probably is a carrier. And in a way, the child benefits by the diagnosis of this risk in the parent who can then be offered surveillance and risk assessment and risk mitigation. By the way, this is some of the stuff that kind of ironically, in a way, scares insurance companies, I think. Ironically, because you'd think it would be a good thing to figure out that somebody's going to get, let's say, breast and ovarian cancer in advance of actually having that diagnosis, since from a purely financial point of view, it should be less expensive to prevent the cancer than to treat the cancer, never mind the toll on the individual. And I don't think they doubt that really, um, but for one thing, there's this concern about opening Pandora's box on lots of testing for incidental findings that may or may not really lead anywhere, but probably will cost a lot of money. Um, and you know, general concern about you know, doing all these things when realizing people pass through insurance companies pretty quickly. So the investment for your future health in our system is not necessarily the first thought on the mind of all the companies who may only be covering that individual for a short time. So I, this is still a, a very um, dynamic area, and I guess I'm optimistic that the case will be made that this will become more and more often covered as time passes. So moving on to preconceptional screening. Now Laura is married and she and her husband considering starting a family and they're um, of Northern European ancestry offered carrier testing for cystic fibrosis, perhaps among other things. There has been for a long time in the U.S. a sort of opportunity to offer preconceptional testing to couples, oftentimes guided by ancestry. And this is not a full list, but here are a few examples of um, tests that are commonly offered based on ancestry and fundamentally based on uh, a particular set of variants that are found more commonly in individuals with a specific ancestry versus others. And some cases, the carrier frequencies can be quite appreciable. That information then can be used as a guide in terms of family planning, um, including possibilities of prenatal testing. This is a moving target, too. I pulled a screenshot from one company, with which, by the way, I have no involvement, 
um, and you can't read it. You can just be impressed by the number of um, conditions that are offered for screening, and I think this is increasingly becoming the case. Some of those conditions are vanishingly rare, and so therefore very few couples will turn out to be both carriers for a pathogenic variant. I guess the philosophy, though, is the incremental cost of adding a variant to the list now is dwindling to almost zero. And as a consequence, there's an argument, well, maybe this is vanishing or rare, but somebody is going to be affected by this condition. And if you could figure that out in advance, why wouldn't you? Um, and especially if you do know the natural history of the condition. These are not all actionable conditions. In fact, probably most of them, or at least a high proportion, aren't, um, which is why they're on a preconceptional screen. So the question is beginning to be asked, well, what about sequencing here? Would that be a better way of picking up carrier tests? And well, the answer there is it's, it's sort of a complicated territory, I think. Um, one of the issues is that there are plenty of sort of ambiguously and maybe even erroneously annotated variants in the literature. So you can find a variant and think it's pathogenic, and it will sometimes turn out the evidence base for that wasn't as good as was perhaps imagined. And so you could actually, at least potentially, give misinformation with wholesale sequencing until we have a better handle on what the pathogenicity of variants actually might be. Another issue is just what the carrier burden is. So I pulled a screenshot from this paper quoted at the upper left. They didn't do whole sequencing, actually. It was really looking at, I think it was 450 genes. But you notice that only a small proportion of people just with that list of genes were not a carrier for anything. Almost everybody was a carrier for some things and a small number of people for many things. And I think it's a fair statement that if you sequence the genome of everybody in the room, we are all carriers for something that if it were homozygous would cause some kind of important medical condition. Chances are partners are similarly carriers unless we're from the same ethnicity or even in other ways related, may be low. However, um, the carrier frequency in the population is likely collectively across the genome to be quite high, which means that somebody's going to have to be there to provide counseling to individuals based on this test, and argument could be that the number of counselors out there is just not scalable to the potential need, which I think argues, on the one hand, for training more counselors, but on the other hand, for coming up with new paradigms of how counseling can be done that might not require the kind of traditional, you know, one person, one patient in a room with one counselor talking one gene at a time. It just may not really work as you start looking at a genome's worth of data. All right, so what about prenatal testing? Actually, they are found to be CF carriers, um, but they then elect to have a prenatal test and the fetus is not found to be a carrier. Uh, there is a long history, as I'm sure you're aware, of prenatal diagnosis, um, beginning with amniocentesis, um, now the possibility of chorionic villus sampling, and even pre-implantation testing, um, biopsy of a blastomere, testing it for a variant that the fetus is at risk, or the embryo is at risk for, and then implanting embryos back into the mother demonstrated not to be carriers of that particular mutation. What about looking at non-invasive approaches? Um, this is a screenshot from a paper a few years ago looking at what has now come to be called non-invasive prenatal screening, or some would say prenatal testing, wherein a sample of mother's blood is obtained. Uh, we all have DNA circulating in our blood from cells that degenerate included in that if a woman is pregnant is a small proportion of fetal DNA by doing sequencing and very sophisticated bioinformatic analysis, it's possible to essentially count the numbers of copies of chromosomes 13, 18, and 21, the three associated with live-born trisomy syndromes, and have a, a reasonable ascertainment then of pregnancies where a fetus with trisomy is being carried. In addition now, this is um, being looked at as ways of picking up other copy number changes, um, and this is likely to be a moving target over time. And you're probably aware that this same technology is now beginning to be used in a very different 
contact so-called liquid biopsy um, because not only can you pick up these fetal changes, but if an individual has a cancer which includes cells that are dying and releasing their DNA into the bloodstream, you can also pick up cancer-specific rearrangements. In fact, I think there have been a few examples of pregnant women who incidentally happen to have undetected, previously undetected cancer who have had it detected because there were a large number of copy number changes well beyond 13, 18, or 21, indicative of um, genomic instability in a tumor that up until that point they didn't know they had. What about sequencing the fetal genome? Is that a feasible option? And well, again, a screenshot from a paper a few years ago now uh, where this was done as proof of principle. That same DNA could be sequenced, and if you know the mother's and father's sequence together with what you can see in the DNA from mother's blood, you can infer the fetal sequence. It's not a mainstream test. I guess a year or two ago, a colleague um, who's a bioethicist asked if I would work with them on a paper, a, sort of an uh, editorial um, that ultimately was published in the New England Journal. Um, should parents who want to have their fetal sequence done be allowed to do that? And the premise was that yeah, if that's what they wanted to do, that there wasn't really a sort of ethical grounding to say, no, you can't have that, um, realizing all the decisions that parents make on behalf of their children. Um, honestly, I expected, having had the experience with the ACMG guidelines, that this would generate a lot of discussion, and it really didn't, um, and certainly it's not being done on a routine basis, nor was the argument in this paper that it should be. It was more a question of, would you say no if somebody wanted it, then that you would recommend it? I don't think we were by any means recommending it be done, uh, but not saying that it shouldn't be done if somebody was willing to do it, and I guess implicitly willing to pay for it. Okay, let's move on to pre-symptomatic testing. So Laura's now 45. And she's just learned that her older sister has been diagnosed with breast cancer, and now she's concerned about her own risks. Um, and there, in fact, are others in the family. Now, this is not uh, meant to be their family tree. It's actually a kind of modified um, pedigree of a family we did see in our own clinic. This was the person who sought counseling. She had a sister with breast cancer, a cousin, an aunt, and a grandmother. And then also a aunt with ovarian cancer and an uncle with prostate cancer. And actually, there was cancer on the mother's side of the family, too. So based on that family history, this was a few years ago, um, testing for BRCA1 and 2 were offered. However, it was offered first not to the proband, but to her sister. And her sister, indeed, was found to carry a known pathogenic variant in the BRCA1 gene. And that allowed us then to test the proband, and it turned out she was negative. And the reason for doing it that way, it's not intuitively obvious that you would test a relative before you test your own patient, is that knowing that her sister actually carried a mutation, it's a fair guess that it accounts for the family history of breast and ovarian cancer on the father's side of the family so that the negative test has great significance because it more or less erases that concern. Whereas if we, had only had, if we had only tested her and had nobody in this side of the family who had had cancer be tested, there would always be a bit of doubt as to whether this particular pair of genes accounts for the family history. And if it didn't, we might have not tested for the right thing in our patient, and we wouldn't know for sure what her risk really was. So it was very powerful where possible to test an affected family member, because then you have a high confidence in the um, ability of that variant to be predictive of the risk in your patient. You know, there's a discussion now since the tradition, well, tradition is probably the wrong word, but the sort of standard has been when a person is concerned about risk of cancer on a genetic basis, usually it's based on family history. Sometimes it's based on being relatively young at the time when the cancer occurs, or it may be that a person has had more than one primary cancer. Those are the red flags that tend to point towards a genetic predisposition. 
And so we usually see individuals, I can tell you in our clinic, we're seeing people almost every day now um, where that kind of history occurs and you make an assessment of risk and then send whatever tests seem to be appropriate given the spectrum of cancers that has been identified in the family. Uh, but there is an increasing sort of um, discussion about whether BRCA testing particularly should be offered even on a non-family history basis, but um, to all women potentially of certain ancestries or even all women, period. And the rationale is that there are some examples of people that have very small families that just nobody happened to have cancer in at least recent enough generations anybody knows about it. Going back more than a few generations is usually hard to do. Um, and so you will miss some individuals. I can tell you for sure in, in our clinic, we have had a few examples of people that ended up being tested that I probably, at the time when it was sent, wasn't so sure this really made sense because the, there really wasn't much family history. Um, and then you get surprised when a positive result comes back and realize that it would have been easy to miss this. It's a debatable point because there are issues of cost and potentially variants of unknown significance that get found. It's being tested, actually. My colleagues at Hudson Alpha are doing this in Huntsville now as a sort of pilot program. There have been others. Uh, so it's a, a point that I think is likely to be discussed for a while, and hopefully there'll be data that will give us a better sense of what the clinical utility of that approach is. You may remember going back now, I guess about 20 years, more or less, when the genes were first identified, there was a debate also like, why would you want to know that you had a genetic variant that predicted a high risk of breast or ovarian cancer, or same could be said for colon cancer, if you can't do anything about it? Now, you've just learned the name of the thing that you may get, but maybe won't, and is it just going to sort of you know, obsess you now with this worry without having anything you can do about it. And in the early days, though, there were some things that made sense to do. There wasn't a lot of data, but there is now. This is just one of many, many papers showing a significant benefit to salpingo ophorectomy compared with surveillance in terms of prevention of breast cancer, even though it's not the breasts in this case uh, that were surgically removed. So between surgery, mastectomy and ophorectomy and salpingo ophorectomy, um, various other approaches to surveillance, including MRI and chemo prevention. There's a lot of options now that can be offered. And so this has really, I think, proved itself to be extremely clinically useful. Well, sequencing not only may contribute to identification of individuals at risk of cancer, based on family history, but in addition to selecting the appropriate treatment for an individual actually diagnosed with cancer. And increasingly now, there's either a tendency to compare normal and tumor, or sometimes because of costs, just look at tumor, which can even be done from paraffin-embedded samples, and then identify a set of genes that are believed to be driving that tumor and use that information as a basis for selecting appropriate medications that target specific mechanisms. And it, first of all, logically is an extremely compelling argument, so much so that I don't know what it's like here. I can tell you in, in Birmingham, you can listen to the radio and hear about you know, why you should, if you have cancer, go to some clinic because they'll sequence your genome. And, there are even billboards about it, so it's become a, I would argue, a, a fairly hyped area, actually. Um, how much good does it do? There are a fair number of examples of individuals where it was possible to target a therapy to a gene that you might not have previously imagined would be relevant, and it has made a big difference, at least in the short run. Problem is, number one, there aren't drugs for every possible target you might identify now. So sometimes you get information, but it doesn't necessarily guide your management. At least that's my perspective as a non-oncologist. But the other point is, as I'm sure you're all aware, cancer is a dynamic entity. If you didn't believe in evolution, this will convince you because it is you know, evolution in real time um, happening. So you give a drug and it works for a while and then the cancer sort of mutates its way around that drug, uh, 
And the interesting and, well, I don't know, interesting is the right word, the challenging thing is that you can have multiple metastases and there's no guarantee the genomes for those individual metastases even will be the same anymore. Um, so it may not be any one drug that you have to choose, but could actually be a whole family of drugs. So it's a, it's a very tough area, I think, um, in terms of um, evolving. But over time, whether it really makes sense to sequence your cancer genome today and expect that it's going to make a long-lasting benefit, it's probably true in some cases and perhaps debatable in others. And there is a tendency now to look at panels of genes that are targeting things that we know we have drugs to treat. Uh, but over time, since cancer is fundamentally a dynamic genetic disorder, um, it certainly will help inform us about the cast of characters and the pathways that are relevant as time goes on, and we hope also as we proceed into better approaches to treatment. I wouldn't exclude, by the way, treatments of rare single gene disorders. I think for a while, as genomics was sort of evolving, there was this perception that, you know, the where this really was going to make a difference was common disease and rare disease was kind of 20th century stuff, and now we're in the 21st century. And what I think has happened between what I mentioned earlier on about breaking the diagnostic odyssey, but also now even in therapeutics, is a realization that rare disease offers huge opportunities to improve outcomes. Um, this is one that has resulted in FDA-approved drug, tuberous sclerosis complex, which is an area of clinical interest of mine, where, among other things, individuals get these subependymal giant cell astrocytomas or multiple renal angiomyolipomas. And a particular drug, Everolimus, has been approved by the FDA. It inhibits mTOR, which happens to be ultimately regulated by the genes that are involved in tuberous sclerosis complex. There are two. Only one will be mutated in any one individual. It disrupts the complex. It results in high, <coughs> excuse me, high levels of mTOR signaling in this drug, among others, inhibits mTOR. I think this will probably remain as a kind of unique case history in one way, which is um, mTOR stands for mammalian target of rapamycin, and it was discovered, I believe, in yeast as a um, factor that was regulated by an antibiotic, rapamycin. And once it was realized that the Hamartin tuberin complex ultimately, when disrupted, leads to increased mTOR signaling, it was like the name of the drug that you should test was written on the label of the pathway. And sure enough, rapamycin originally did show benefit, and subsequently a rapamycin-like drug was, as you heard, approved by the FDA. And so now I see patients with these lesions, and it's been a while, a long while, actually, since I've sent any of the SEGA patients to a neurosurgeon or the renal patients used to go to radiology for um, embolization of the lesion, and we, these days, most of the time, write a prescription. Similarly, in cystic fibrosis, which is a mutated chloride channel. Uh, there's been effort to develop drugs that either improve the function of the mutated channel or reduce its degradation uh, when there's abnormal protein folding. This is a screenshot from one paper for one particular drug, Ivacaftor. Uh, the lung function was dramatically improved in those treated versus untreated. I think there are now two FDA-approved drugs in this setting. Um, so it's an example of drugs that I think it's fair to say wouldn't have been on the list to treat or even didn't exist until the genetic mechanisms were known and then subsequently informed an approach to development of treatment. And uh, that's certainly been the area of interest um, for myself in neurofibromatosis, as you've heard, uh, where we have a clinical trials consortium doing clinical trials with drugs that only are now on the list to use because we have some understanding of the underlying pathogenesis, which followed from the discovery of the genes involved in these, um, this family of disorders. Well, finally, let me say some words about predispositional testing. So Laura's now 60, been well, and now the question about whether genomic testing should be, they should partake in this based on internet-available options. And a few years back, as the ability to do 
the genotyping came down in cost. And as mostly GWAS studies had shown associations with common disease, a set of companies entered this sort of marketplace with direct-to-consumer testing. Uh, two of them are no longer in that business, and this one, which is still in the business, has had a significant encounter with the FDA. Um, I did it, by the way, at my own cost or my own expense um, a few years ago before the FDA got in the picture. Uh, this is the kind of data you could get then. You wouldn't get now because they no longer are focusing on these common disorders um, as they did at the time. But uh, this is what my risk of type 2 diabetes was based on whatever genotype they identified. You can see it's not too different from the population average. And in a nutshell, that's kind of what I found in general. I was at average risk for most everything um, you heard of, which I didn't think was so bad. But I also had, I think, a fair ability to take this with a grain of salt and to realize that you're only chipping away at the edges of risk with this and that not all the risk of type 2 diabetes is accounted for by genes. And even the number of genes that might be relevant, only a subset of them, were being tested for here. The fear was, well, number one, how valid really is this, which I think is what concerned the FDA. And secondly, what would a person do with this information if your risk was found to be low, would it lead you to conclude that you're immune to type 2 diabetes and hence ignore the advice, which, by the way, is the advice for most every common disease on the list they tested for, lose weight and exercise more. And if you decided, well, now that's not relevant to you because your genotype puts you at low risk, you might actually put yourself at high risk. The opposite could also be true. Maybe it's motivational to learn that your risk is increased and you will finally follow that advice that you might have previously ignored. A debatable point, but as it stands now, the concerns have been sort of addressed, I think, in terms of realizing that um, the evidence base for the common disease prediction is less robust than it needs to be to use it in this kind of context, so that's not really the focus anymore. You do, by the way, get this list of pharmacogenetic variants. This is mine. I'm at increased sensitivity to warfarin, so a standard dose would put me at increased risk of hemorrhage. I printed this out and gave it to my primary care doctor and got the expected, now what am I supposed to do with this look? Um, it got put in a pile. I don't know if it ever got scanned into our electronic health record, but it, even if it did, I can tell you it's buried there. And the day should ever come when I need this drug, it's unlikely to be realized unless either they've heard this lecture since I've given it enough times or um, unless, they, unless I'm conscious enough, I guess, to um, tell them. But the truth is that the issues on clinical utility, in my judgment anyway, of pharmacogenetics hinge as much on systems issues as they do on actual clinical utility. It's debatable whether the cost of testing actually is sort of um, justified given the kind of societal costs that you save in terms of, of poor outcomes and whether there are alternative ways of making these decisions that might be less costly. But I think that equation may change if one does the testing at a single point in time for multiple variants where, again, the incremental cost of putting one on a panel becomes really negligible, um, then the cost part of the equation really falls away. And I don't think doctors are ever going to consciously say, before I put a person on this drug, I'd better get a pharmacogenetic test. They will for some things, perhaps, but mostly I think this, if it sees the kind of mainstream, is going to do so through living in the background in the electronic health record and being a sort of pop-up that says, you know, this is somebody you either might not want to put on this drug if they're at risk of some severe adverse outcome. That, by the way, happens now in parts of Southeast Asia and China where a specific HLA variant predicts the Stevens-Johnson syndrome based on exposure to drugs like carbamazepine. Everybody gets tested in some areas. They carry a card, and that's what informs their physician that they should or shouldn't be put on this drug if there's a clinical reason to use that drug. Uh, 
So that kind of approach over time, I think, is likely to be the way this will be used. So if you kind of take a big picture look now at um, where is all of this headed, you could ask two questions. You know, if, should everybody be sequenced, first of all, I guess, but also then if you did, when would you do it and where would the data live? So when could you do it? Well, I mentioned you could, in principle, do it prenatally. Raises lots of questions. How much do you want to know about a fetus in terms of what might be untreatable, unpreventable adult onset disorders? Or you could perhaps do it in the newborn screen, as you've heard, somewhat similar set of questions. Yes, you can diagnose some things that maybe you could treat if you knew that they were going to happen. but. A lot of things you'll figure out you might not be able to do much about, but how does it change the nurturing of a child to know about these things? Or do it in childhood, just a little older? Um, well, so all of them raise those same set of questions, so maybe you should do it if you're going to do it at all in adulthood. Only challenge there, yes, you can give good information and obtain informed consent, but maybe you've already lost the opportunity to intervene on some things that would happen earlier in life. And then if you were to do it, where would you keep the information? Well, in the electronic health record, you might say. A couple of challenges there. Any of you who are clinicians in whatever electronic health record you're using are probably aware that the ability of current day electronic health records to mobilize genomic information is still some ways off. As a matter of fact, the ability to mobilize even routine health information in some cases isn't as robust as we wish it would be. So I think many people would be concerned that the electronic health record, they, maybe it'll be the long-term solution is, is not ready for accommodating large-scale genomic information right now. And even if it were, pretty much nobody, I think, these days, or very few, maybe not nobody, very few live their whole lives in association with one particular health context. Person grows up, they go from a pediatrician to an internist maybe. People move, therefore they're not necessarily getting their care today from where their genome sequence might have been done two years ago. Uh, will it be available? And even if perchance there's a way of dealing with that, if they're traveling and they need access to the sequence, is it going to be there if it's locked in an electronic health record somewhere? So I don't know that it's the most robust way to do this. It could be stored in the cloud, which I think it already is for many people. Good news is that you should be able to access it pretty much anywhere, anytime. You do have to have confidence in the security, though I think that's an answerable issue. It could live on a personal device that already does for some people, which is fine as long as you have it with you that day or don't put it in the washing machine or whatever else can happen. So, um, it would be a viable alternative. And finally, my favorite is the most efficient place to store genetic information seems to be the cell nucleus. And nobody ever forgets to bring those to the doctor. And it is possible to imagine that the cost of sequencing could go to a point where it's cheaper to resequence when you need it than to bother storing it and then just reanalyze it for whatever the question of the day turns out to be. I have no idea really how this will evolve, but anyway, I think all these possibilities are on the table. Back to the original question I asked, when will doctors use genomics on a routine basis in their day-to-day -day practice? Well, arguably, some are, especially, I think, medical geneticists have very much embraced cytogenomics and genome sequencing. I think you'll find those that do preconceptional and prenatal testing have embraced it. But what about sort of mainstream day-to-day -day practice? And here's my answer. So this is, you can't read it, I know, but it's a screenshot of iTunes. So the reason I show it is if you think back, I don't know how long it is now, it must be close to 20 years, um, 15 plus years maybe, uh, it was possible to store music on an electronic device in the late 1990s. And if you tried to do it, you could either copy a CD you owned or, you may remember, you would go online and there were illegal, it turns out, music sharing sites that you could go to and download. It seemed like a great thing. Everything was free and all these things you 
never thought you'd own, you could own. Um, then it became clear it wasn't a legal approach. Well, all right, so then the, um, some companies came into existence, and I remember using one one time, and it was so complicated I gave up quickly. I couldn't really make it work, and it was when this approach came into existence, and now many others that are out there, that it became easy to use, sort of fun, not expensive, and ended up becoming mainstream. So my answer to when genomics will be used day to day is when somebody invents the iTunes of the medical record, um, something that's readable, easy, fun, works seamlessly. And I think that information access is when physicians are likely to use it. I'll end with a point about education and about the sort of deployment of this. So a lot of people talk about the genome as the book of life. And I like to think of it not so much as the book of life, but as the library of life, because you could argue each gene is sort of a story unto itself, or by this metaphor, a book. The genome is the whole collection of genes, so the library is the collection of books. And if you look at this from the perspective of a practitioner who wasn't educated in genetics and genomics, you could say, well, all right, so genome's a library full of books, and what do I remember about genetics? Well, one thing I may remember is that the genetic code is a three-letter code. So you can say, all right, what's a book that relies on three-letter words? And this may come to mind, and you could come to conclude, well, how hard could this be? And my answer is that if you read the genome as a book and you want to look for a literary metaphor, a better one, is this, that you could teach a first grader, I think, to read Ulysses, if by that you mean pronounce the words, even that might not be so easy maybe, but it should be feasible, but the chances they'd understand it, as a matter of fact, the chances a college student would understand it, um, not so easy, right, because it's full of obscure allusions and you have to read between the lines, so that there are books about how to read this book just as there were books about how to read the genome. And I think that's a fair statement of what reading the genome is like. And I can tell you, when we have our conferences, as we do now regularly with our colleagues at Hudson Alpha, looking at genome sequencing data from patients that we've been seeing, you sort of feel like, you know, a discoverer in a new world, um, uncovering things sometimes no one's ever seen before or has been seen very infrequently at best. And there are debates about is this or isn't this pathogenic, and it requires a pretty high level of sophistication to figure that out and to stretch a literary metaphor. Uh, it doesn't take long to pass through the looking glass, and the rules you thought you knew don't always apply quite as you thought. You know, there are examples of variants that do not change the amino acid, so we would have previously overlooked them but then they actually turn out to alter splicing, and they are pathogenic. So a lot of examples now of things that don't seem to behave quite the way we would have originally predicted. So it's not necessarily an argument that the only ones who should ever do genetic or genomic testing are bona fide medical geneticists or certified genetic counselors, because if that's the position we take, I think it's going to be a very difficult way to scale this to really becoming mainstream in use. I do think there are going to be um, futures for people training in medical genetics and genetic counseling for a long time to come, because someone's going to have to help interpret this sort of um, complex Ulysses-like genome and, you know, figure out when you pass through the looking glass what's on the other side. So I have a very strong um, sort of bright future for people who are interested in that training. But I also think we have to work very hard to provide point-of-care education to physicians and other health professionals who are really going to be at the front lines of using this, and increasingly innovative tools to help explain genetic and genomic information to an increasingly large population who stand to benefit from it. Um, as you all know, here especially, um, we stand to learn a huge amount in the coming years as the Precision Medicine Initiative occurs so that I think there will be a much better annotation both of the genome and its relevance to both health and disease. 
uh, that will strongly inform this effort. Uh, but I'll end with what's almost now becoming a cliche. It's been used a lot, but I think it really is an a, um, exceedingly powerful statement coined by Alan Kay, who, as I understand it, is viewed as the father of the um, laptop computer, which I think would be a really great thing to have on your CV if you could. But anyway, um, he said the best way to predict the future is to invent it. It's certainly what goes on here. It's what's going on now around the world. And I think it's what makes this era the one that's by far the most exciting time in the history, probably of, the, of humanity, to be involved in practice of medicine, and for that matter, especially genetics and genomics. So I have no idea what the future is going to look like in 60 years, other than to say it will look nothing like the world that we're in today. And I think genetics and genomics will be a huge driver of helping it to get there. Thank you. I guess there's time for questions. Is that true? Yeah. Yeah, so the question is, how hard did I scrutinize the 23andMe results to val validate that they were based on accurate um, risk estimates? To be honest, the answer was not that much because I think I went into it with a pretty high level of skepticism from the start that I didn't really think this was, I thought it was interesting and I suppose you could say amusing. A lot of people view this as recreational genomics and it kind of was that from my point of view. So I didn't take it seriously enough to bother to, you know, delve into, you know, the number of variants was too many for me to put the time into it. And I guess I didn't think there was a high enough likelihood that I'd learn anything that would be that meaningful. So I never really bothered. Um, my sense was also that whatever risks they were looking at were only, you know, part of the true risk equation for anything that you might be at risk for. I will say parenthetically, though, um, I did learn that I was a carrier for something, which I didn't know before. It wouldn't have changed anything in terms of um, family planning, I don't suppose, but um, it actually could have implications for the future. There's not a whole lot I can do about it, and so I don't, you know, I've looked at that a little bit, but it kind of is what it is. Um, so the answer is no, because uh, I just never really felt like the common disease risk was going to be as powerful as maybe it was originally hoped for. I kind of view common disease risk at this moment kind of in the same category as weather prediction, um, or maybe it's more like climate prediction, and I kind of viewed this as about the equivalent of looking at the farmer's almanac to figure out what you should wear tomorrow, and my feeling was it's kind of interesting, but not going to really change anything. 